All right, so The Flash has been in theaters for about a week now. I am somewhat surprised that it didn't do that well in the box office. I mean, I guess I can kind of understand why, but at the same time, it is The Flash, you know? Pretty big DC name. But in any case, this is gonna be my spoiler talk. So yeah, spoiler warning. I'm gonna be talking about what happens in the movie and my thoughts on them. So if you have not seen this movie yet and you plan on it, you should speed away. Unless you don't care, in which case, hey. Well, let's talk about this movie. All right, the first opening action scene is, yeah, like I said, is my favorite in the movie, probably. Because he gets a call from Alfred, and then he's just hauling ass, and you see him going through, like, the cities and across the water. God, that's so cool. That is pretty much a mandatory thing you gotta have if you're making a Flash movie, you know? How we can get from one point in the U.S. to another that's, like, way far off in a matter of seconds. And yeah, this hospital is just collapsing, and all the babies fall out the window. I was literally like this. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe this movie just did that. I mean, bad CG or not, just the fact that this movie had the gall to throw a bunch of babies out the window and have them falling to their deaths. I was like, holy shit. I mean, yeah, obviously the Flash does save them all, but I'm just saying, that was a really cool scene. And plus you have Batfleck in his final hurrah, doing all sorts of badass shit. And the Wonder Woman cameo, which, all right, this is now two DC movies in a row where Wonder Woman had a cameo. And in both cases, it just seemed kind of needless, especially in this movie, though. Like, she just shows up, says a couple things, and then she flies off. And I was like, granted, it's great to see her and hear her awesome theme again. Might be for the last time, too, since honestly, I don't know if she's going to carry over into the James Gunn verse. But really, her cameo was like, oh, sorry, I'm late. Glad I could help. All right, see ya. I was like, well, what was she doing? Like, it just seemed really random. Moving on, I do want to point out that we actually never learned who killed Nora Allen. All we do know is that someone broke into the house and killed her, and we know it wasn't Henry. I mean, Laura says it was Reverse Flash. And I think Andy Muschietti said that, yeah, that is, like, who it is, and they will explore that in a sequel if it ever happens. But for now, we just don't know. That's still a mystery. Which, honestly, I kind of like. You know what else I really like about this movie? The fact that it canonizes Zack Snyder's Justice League. Like when Barry first meets up with Iris West, and she's like, I feel like we saw each other a few years ago. I was like, oh yeah, you know, in Zack Snyder's Justice League, the scene where he rescued her, that wasn't in Justice League. Yeah, that's what Iris was calling back to. Also, after the Flash goes back in time for the first time, when we see the Chrono Bowl, which I'll get to in a second, he's talking to Bruce Wayne, and he's like, oh, you went back in time, like in Pajarnov. Pajarnov is that city in Russia where they were in Justice League, and, you know, the Flash went back in time in Zack Snyder's Justice League, Again, that didn't happen in Joss Whedon's version. So I love that. Yeah, this movie says, yeah, Zack Snyder's Justice League, that is the official DCEU canon. Love that shit. Major props to that. Getting back to it though, all right, so the Chrono Bowl, as Barry Allen calls it. This is, I guess, the method through which he goes back in time in this movie, which is really cool in concept. You know, it looks kind of like a zoetrope. I just wish the CG looked a little better, you know, or a lot better. But it is cool, you know, it's a new thing we see for the Flash, along with phasing through walls. Yeah, we see that the Flash can phase through walls, which I knew he could do, because he did that in the Flash TV show. And I knew how he did it. He does it by vibrating so that the molecules go through the molecules of the wall or whatever it is. That was really cool, and I like that they incorporated that into this movie. Eventually, Barry Allen ends up in this new universe, where we spend most of this movie, and we learn that the year is 2013, otherwise known as the year Man of Steel came out. Ten years ago, which, yeah, I didn't even realize, this movie is kind of like marking the 10-year anniversary and death, I guess, of the DCEU. So it's a celebration of sorts of the franchise. So we're here 10 years ago, we meet up with 2013 Barry, and not only is this during the events of Man of Steel, but it's also the day that Barry gets his powers. And so he's like, all right, you gotta go to this lab so the lightning can hit you. And what ends up happening is that the lightning strikes and it goes through our Barry and into 2013 Barry. So our Barry loses his powers actually, and 2013 Barry gets powers. Which was kind of a twist that I was not expecting. That was a pretty funny scene though where he was trying to run in the lobby and he's just running in circles all weird like. That made me laugh. So now we have a young Barry who's just learning how he has power. So yeah, this is kind of covering the origin story of the Flash. Since we didn't really get that before Justice League, he's doing the Speedy Gonzalez thing. But yeah, now Zod is here, and the events of Man of Steel are kind of happening as we knew them. We learned that our Barry was actually there during the events of Man of Steel, when that world engine was starting to terraform Metropolis. So yeah, not only was Bruce Wayne there, but also Barry Allen. But he was still getting used to his power, so he couldn't save everyone. He could save a kid, but not the kid's dad in his makeshift suit. So now we're like, okay, maybe we can save more people from Zod. Let's get the Justice League together. But, oh, the Justice League doesn't exist. There's no Cyborg, there's no Wonder Woman, there's no Aquaman. There is a cameo, though, from Tamara Morrison as Thomas Curry. That was pretty cool. 
There is a Batman though. And yeah, this is where Michael Keaton's Batman comes in. And he's a total wash up. He's all scraggly like Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi or something. We don't really know why he's this way, but he does explain why time is the way it is in this movie. He explains that when you go back in time and change the past, you don't just change the future here, but you create kind of an intersection. When you change things, you're changing the future and the past, essentially creating a new universe altogether. To which I was like, I don't think that's how it works. It's all theoretical, of course, but that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but whatever, it's fiction, I can roll with it. It's retrocausal, as Bruce Wayne describes it. So now we're off to find Superman, Superman. We go to that Russian prison where we find Supergirl. That was a pretty cool long take where we see her hand in the snow and then the sunlight comes over it and it heals right then and there, that was cool. And then she just wrecks shop. I was like, oh yeah, okay. She's, she's doing it. Supergirl's a badass man, are you kidding me? Yeah, I thought she was awesome in this movie. And eventually with her help, our Barry gets his powers back. Cause they're doing Frankenstein experiments on him and they're pulling the lever and they're like, it's alive! Do it again, oh we can't, the power's out. All right, Supergirl's gonna lift him up into the lightning. Pretty sure that would've just fried him and killed him since there were none of those chemicals there. But whatever, it's fiction, I'll roll with it. And so we're all off to fight Zod. And this is where all the awesome big ass action goes down. The bat wings going after the ships. The two flashes are running, Supergirl's beating the shit out of Kryptonians, and it's all awesome, but then when Supergirl gets stabbed through the back, I was like, oh shit, are you gonna tell me that Supergirl dies in this movie? All right. And then the Batwing gets it, and he's like, I'm going down, but I'm not going down alone. And I was like, holy shit, this movie's also gonna kill off Michael Keaton Batman? Can they do that? Well, they do. The Batwing just crashes into another ship and explodes. I was like, damn. Yeah, in this Flash movie, both Batman and Supergirl fucking die. You gotta think Andy Muschietti was like, wow, I can get away with that. I can kill Batman and Supergirl in my movie. But 2013 Barry's like, no, we can go back in time and fix this like you did. And so we keep trying to fix it, but we ultimately learned that, yeah, this is a canon event. This needs to happen. They have to die. Which I'll admit, when I first saw that, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Because if the canon event is Batman and Supergirl die fighting Zod, that doesn't make sense because they wouldn't even be there if it weren't for Barry Allen coming from another universe. Which I'll be honest, this is actually something I thought about in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse as well. Just bear with me on this. If my Miles Morales is an anomaly. If he was never supposed to become Spider-Man, then why does he have canon events that need to happen, you know? That is kind of a loophole. But whatever, it's fiction, I'll roll with it. But it turns out that 2013 Barry keeps going back in time like a million times to try to save Batman and Supergirl. And this is where our Barry realizes that that just can't happen. Yeah, in this conflict of logic versus morality, our Barry ends up taking Miguel O'Hara's side. And he's trying to convince 2013 Barry, he's like, no, this needs to happen because otherwise you're gonna destroy the multiverse. And of course, you know, there is that lesson of these scars make us who we are, which Batflick was telling him earlier. If not for Uncle Ben, most of us wouldn't be here. I just find that really funny that this movie's like, no, you know, we gotta have those scars for character growth and that's the good thing. Whereas Across the Spider-Verse is conveying the opposite message, where it's like, no, you gotta find a solution to save everyone and be a good person no matter what. I just, I love that contrast. That is Marvel versus DC at its finest. And so we learned that 2013 Barry constantly going back in time a million times to try to save Batman and Supergirl eventually ends up becoming this dark flash figure, this thing that ultimately pushed Barry into this timeline in the first place. And now we get the big multiverse scene with all the weird CG cameos because we see all these other worlds starting to collide with each other. First one we see is George Reeves Superman, which my dad pointed out, why was that in black and white? To which I was like, yeah, holy shit, you got a good point. That would make sense for us because that was a black and white TV show, but in the movie, it should not have been in black and white. That should have been a color universe like all the rest. Yeah, I don't know. And then we see Christopher Reeve's Superman, which I was like, yeah, of course. But then we see Helen Slater's Supergirl, and I was like, oh my god. Really? You gotta remind us of that movie that fucking bombed and everyone hated? Don't remind us of the bad shit. Come on, why would you do that? We see Adam West Batman, and then, <laughs> this is the funniest, we get Nicolas Cage Superman. All right, for those of you who don't know, in the 90s, Tim Burton was gonna make a movie called Superman Lives starring Nicolas Cage as Superman. That is real, that is fact, you can look it up. The movie ended up not happening, but the fact that he shows up in this movie, I was like, oh my god. Ah, <laughs> uh, wow. And I'll tell you, this scene would have been really cool if the CG wasn't so bad. Because all these cameos, Adam West, Christopher Reeve, George Reeves, Nicolas Cage, they all look like really bad CGI. And that really just ruined it for me, I can't lie. Because I imagine this was supposed to be the scene where everyone was like, oh my god, all the cool stuff. But for me, I was like, ugh, just, ugh, no. Again, great in concept. Poor in execution. That's all I'm saying. But 2013 Barry ends up sacrificing himself 
coming around full circle and erasing Dark Flash and saving the multiverse. Which, yeah, great, awesome, we have victory! And so our Barry has to go back and set things right and ensure his own mother's death. But then he's like, well, what if I can free my father? And so I guess he changes the placement of the tomatoes to be on a higher shelf in the store. So when they're in court and they're watching the footage, they see his dad looking up at the camera. So yeah, they're like, oh my God, he was innocent. He wasn't there when Nora died. All right, Barry, I thought you learned, dude. What did Batflick tell you in the beginning of the movie? You step on the wrong blade of grass, you have no idea what you could do. Sure enough, after the court case is done, they go outside, he sets up a date with Iris, which I was like, dude, Iris, what do you see in him? Eh, you sure know how to pick him, girl. But he's like, oh, Bruce Wayne, man, it's great to hear your voice. I was like, that's not Ben Affleck's voice. Whose voice is that? And we see Bruce Wayne step out of his car and it's George Clooney. I was like, no. George Clooney played Batman in Batman and Robin, which is known by many as the worst Batman movie ever made. So I was like, again, DC, this movie reminding us of the bad shit. Why would they do that? I read somewhere that there were a few different versions of this scene that were gonna end this movie. Like one version was gonna be Batflick and Henry Cavill and Wonder Woman, and another was gonna be something else and they ended up going with George Clooney. I was like, why? Yeah, that was just weird and kind of an anticlimactic note to end the movie on for me. Even Barry Allen's like, who the fuck is this? But I guess this universe is now reset. This is a different universe now, I guess. I don't know like where that's gonna go from here if George Clooney's Bruce Wayne. Ugh, please don't tell me he's gonna be Batman in The Brave and the Bold. Please don't do that. Oh, the horror. But I guess we'll see what happens from here. The post credit scene is just Barry Allen trying to explain his adventures to a drunk Arthur Curry, Jason Momoa making a cameo. If this somehow leads into Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, I'm gonna laugh. But in conclusion, The Flash, like I said, is pretty fucking nuts. It's a really fun movie. It does have some loopholes that I can roll with because whatever, it's fiction. I love the action scenes, but just those weird CG cameos in that multiverse scene, I was like, why did they do it like that? That's just, it was cringe almost. Is this the movie that resets the DC Cinematic Franchise? I guess. It just didn't do it in the way I expected, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Just threw me for a loop is all. But I really enjoy it and I would never be opposed to watching it again. All right, so what are your thoughts on that whole multiverse cameo scene? Did you like it? Am I crazy? Do you think the events of this movie really lead into the reset of the DC Cinematic Franchise? And do you think we'll ever learn who killed Nora Allen? That's a big maybe. Whatever you think, go ahead and leave a comment. And of course, thank you for subscribing. Peace!